what happened is we said that in order for you to do a complete design of the beam, you need to have the demand. This is going to be one side of the equation. Other side is to figure out the capacity of the section, the complete section for the beam. Parameters going to be given to you at the beginning, like all of these variables, is going to be the width B, of course, is going to be given to you. In reality, it's going to be based on experience. And we have certain sides that you'd like to work with. Depends on the beam, the span, and type of construction. Let's say for the academia, for this uh, course, B is going to be given to you, H is going to be given to you, and D you can figure it out if you know H. You remember the relationship between H and D. Um, H is, right, you need to subtract the cover, and maybe if you have a pi, and then one half of the bar diameter. Anyone has any questions on that? Is the internet stable and the Zoom system stable now? Sounds good. Okay, yeah, sounds great. good. Very good, very good. So again, the given information is going to be B, H. You can figure out D pays on H. And then also number of reinforcing bars and the size of the bar. With the number of reinforcing bars and the size of the bars, you can figure out AS, total cross-section area of this team. Nothing else is going to be given to you except for this information and the material properties. Material properties like F prime C, of course you need to know what type of concrete. And the steel grade, like the rebar grade, most likely is gonna be grade 60. If it is not given to you, you assume grade, 50, uh, grade 60, which means yield strength is gonna be 60 KSI. Okay. Now the concrete at the capacity point is gonna be equal to 0.03. So this value is gonna be the same for all type of concrete for all strength. C value, you don't have it. The strain in the steel, you don't have it, right? This A, compression block depth, is going to be related to C. So some analysis is needed. So the stuff that you see here in boxes is giving the information that you know, and everything here is going to be in circles. This is something that you need to determine. Make sense? So the, the stuff in rounds, like in circles, we don't have them. But this gives you the data, giving information to you. The 0.03 is constant. You can assume it's going to be given to you, right? But it's going to be constant. I'm not going to mention it in the problem. No one's going to tell me concrete is going to be failing at 0.03 or 0.04. It's just one value from the code, right? So in order for me to do this, I need to set compression is going to be equal to the tension force. When I set them equal to each other, look at all the variables. Here is the equation now. When I set tension equals to compression in this equation, it says here 0.85 F prime C B times A. And this side is going to be the compression, right? Y is going to be 0.85 F prime C times the depth A times the width B. And this is equal to AS times FY. We would like to use the strength of the steel to be equal to FY. Why? Because we assume, this is an assumption that we start with, we said that the strain in the steel is going to be greater than the yield point. You guys, anyone is not familiar with the yield point for reinforcing steel, the definition of it, or the meaning of it? I'd like to hear from every one of you guys. Can you go over it again? Okay. All right. If just one person says we need to know it or go through it again, absolutely, we'll do it again. Let me go through it quick. If you go to the presentation that says introduction, this is the one that shows the materials, type of reinforcing, type of concrete, type of aggregate and cement and the whole thing. You can see here the stress strain relationship for this team, which is this one here. This point is what we call the yield point, which I put here my hand on it. Do you guys see it? Yes? Yes. Okay, very good. All right. The stress at this point is called the yield stress. For grade 60 steel, it is equal to 60 KSI, which means 60,000 PSI, right? For grade 75, it is equal to 75 KSI. 
The model plasticity, this ES, the uppercase, is 29,000 KSI. It's going to be constant for all grades of steel. So if the steel grade is 60, it's going to be the same 29,000. If the steel grade is 75, ES is also 29,000. This is not going to change. The thing that's going to change is going to be this F sub Y. You're good with that? You guys are following me? Cool. So, so 29,000 is a constant value? Yeah, 29,000 is just a constant value, right? For all types of steel. Okay? Which is the slope of this line? My target here is to find out the strain at the yield point. That was the, I was talking about when I asked you guys, do you know the definition of the yield strain of a steam? And this one, in order for you to figure it out, having the slope of this line, you say here the strain in the steel equals to the yield stress divided by ES. Why? What's the definition of ES? The definition of ES is is going to be equal to the stress, the Y component, divided by the X component. Again, ES, Y component, divided by X component. is going to be equal to FY, divided by epsilon Y. Follow me? Questions? Uh, repeat that one more time, please. The strain in the steam is going to be equal to the yield stress, divided by ES. Clear? Do you know the reason? You said that you that's the slope of the line. By the ES. Say it again, Andy. I'm sorry. You were talking at the same time. You said the yield divided by the ES. Is yeah. The... Yeah, because definition of ES is the stress, the Y component, divided by the X component, the strain, epsilon. You guys are aware of that, right? So let me write it here. ES, the modulus, equals to FS, let me, ES, the modulus, equals to FS, the stress in the state, divided by epsilon S. Look how I'm going to be typing it. Epsilon S as an E lower case, okay? FS is the Y component. Epsilon S, the X component. ES is giving you the slope of this line, the 29,000. Is it okay, Nathan, now? Nathan? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So if you want to find out the strain in the steel for any given point, it's going to be equal to what? FS divided by ES. Therefore, I'm going to say here, ES, the strain in the steel, equals FS, the stress in the steel, divided by ES, which is a 29,000. Let me try this for grade 6 steel. The yield point is 60 KSI. It's right here. So I'm going to say here, ES, the strain at the yield point, ES at the steel. I'm going to be taking it equal to 60 divided by 29,000. It's going to be 0 0.0021. Make sense? Andy? Yes. I want to follow up with you. And Nathan, so, you're good? So, you're, yeah, so you're saying that the stress, the steel stress is, is equivalent to 60 KSI, which is our... At this point? Stress at this point, which is... Um, FS times what again? Yield strength of the metal divided by uh, the, the, the second modulus. Or yes. Yes, this so, is correct. Is... Um, the elastic modulus just basically that's the properties of the steel, correct? Yeah, and it's constant for all grades of steel. Yeah, Andy, Nathan. Yeah, both of you guys, you are okay with that? Yeah, thank you, Professor. Okay, all right, thank you. So let's say here for grade 60, it's going to be 6 divided by 29,000. For grade 75, it's going to be 75 divided by 29,000, same number, right? 
So the strain at the yield point for grade 60 is going to be 0 0.0021. For grade 75, because this is going to be in your homework, it's going to be 0 0.00258. You're good now? Yes, no? Answer quick, please. Uh, question. Uh, question. Uh, so would the grade of steel directly relate to the yield strength of it? Yeah, this is what I was saying. The grade for steel 60 is the yield strength of 60 KSI, this point here on the y-axis. The grade for 75, this point here is going to be 75, is going to be higher. You are absolutely so correct. Example, so, for example, grade 100 would be 100 KSI then? Yeah. Just to make it up. I think for a yes. Make... No, absolutely. No, good question, actually. Thank you. Very good. So what happened here, we would like to assume that the strain in the steel at this position here, at this value, and for all of this given information, is going to be harder than absence of Y. Meaning for grade 6, is going to be greater than 0 0.0021. Because in that case, the stress in the steel is going to be equal to the yield point. So it's going to be simple. It's going to be just FS is going to be equal to FY is going to be 6 case line. Now, from this two triangles, I have some symmetry. I can say 0.03, you guys follow me? Yeah? Awake? Yeah. Divided by C is going to be equal to the strain in the steel divided by D minus C. Now, what is D minus C here? I need to see it, right? D minus C is going to be from here to there. It's going to be this distance here, right? If this is going to be C, this is D, this is going to be D minus C. Okay. So that, I have here an issue because I don't know the actual strain in the steel. I don't know the C distance. But what I can do based on this equation, once I said compression is going to be equal to tension, going to be looking at this equation, I'm going to say 0.85 is just constant. F prime C given, because this is going to be the properties. Right, the properties of the concrete. B is gonna be the width of the beam. A is unknown, so I'm gonna put in a circle. A S given yield strength or strength is gonna be given the problem, right? This is gonna be the rebar properties, like the great six K sign. Based on this, I should be able to solve for A. You say, okay, here we go. Here's the first unknown I'm gonna be able to solve for A. Once I have A, I have beta one which is also another constant, I can figure out C. Once I have C, I can figure out the strain in the steel. Then what else? You have the strain in the steel, you can figure out the phi factor. I'm gonna show you here in one example in the seconds from now. Once you have the phi factor, you come back here and say, now I have the tension force, which is AS times FY, right? I have A, the distance from tension to compression, is going to be the depth D minus A over 2. Why? Because here is D from this point to that point minus A over 2. Now, the final moment at the section is going to be equal to the tension multiplied by Z, D minus A over 2. This is going to be MN. Now, I have the phi factor multiplied by phi by the MN is going to be phi MN, which is actual capacity of the B. Here are the equations that we were just talking about. Here is A based on this equation, because you set here tension equals compression, and then you do this equation, this is going to be Z times S times Fy, the tension force is going to get you here, Mn. Uh, Here's the question. phi factor. Yes. Question. So, um, does Mn stand for uh, flexure strength? Okay. Mn, nominal capacity of the section. Nominal capacity. Let me show you where it is written here. You see this? Like phi men. This is the capacity, right? P is strength reduction factor. Mn is nominal capacity. Inflection, like moment, right? And is there a difference when there is a phi in front and not a phi in front? Yeah. This, this is capacity. This is just nominal capacity. This phi factor, oh, 
is going to be like reduced value. This is going to be the final value that you use in your strength. In so your design. Like a fee, a fee M&M is like a, um, what's like in any condition? Like, oh, this is the max to take? To... Yes, this is a maximum moment, the maximum capacity of the section. Your section cannot be resisted more than fee man. MN is just a calculated out value and is nominal, which means it's not the real design value or capacity point that you'd like to use in your design. Okay, thank you, this is going to have some safety factor in there. Safety factor for it is going to be here for the material and the section is going to be right here in this fee. I'll show you the reason because fee factor goes between 0.9 to 0.65. which means effectively you're going to be using 90% of MN or maybe 0.65 of MN, right? So this is going to be the safety thing. Here, safety percent is going to be, let's say the safety amount is going to be 10% of MN. Here, the safety is going to be 35 MN. Example, concrete section is 4,000 PSI. Yield strength, 60 KSI or 60,000 PSI. Neglect hanger bars. This is going to be like the two hanger bars. They like compression reinforcement. Tension is going to be at the bottom, so I don't really care about this compression reinforcement for now. And say so here, determine the nominal moment strength, which is a capacity, right? Amen. And the design moment strength, amen. Let me look here what is given to me. I have the width, 10 inches. Total depth, 16. Clear cover to where? I'm going to say here to the tie. You see, this is what I call here a tie. One and a half inch. The tie size is what size? Can someone read it for me? 14 inches off center. The tie size. The tie rebar size. Four. Number four. Like half inch, right? So this, between this two hollow lines, right? This two lines is going to be half an inch. The longitudinal rebars, you have three, number eight. Number eight meaning what? In terms of the damper? One inch. One inch, correct. Very good. So first, I need to figure out the depth, effective depth D. How can I do this? It's going to be equal to the 16 inch. Total depth, you subtract two and a half inches. And now I need to know where this two and a half inches come from, right? So I'm going to say, I have here the clear cover is one and a half inch. You had half inch for the tie. Now how much you have? Two inches, right? You had additional half an inch for the radius of this number eight. So it's going to be two and a half inches. This two and a half inches is going to be to the center of the report. Now effective depth becomes 13 and a half inch. Now I know where does this come from. Any questions? Yeah, it might, it might be a dumb question, but how no, number no eight question. is the one? Uh, how did you get uh, one for number eight? Okay. For the rebar? For oh. each rebar size? This yeah. rebar size, number eight means eight eighths of an inch. So it's going to be one inch. Number yeah. four is going to be four eighths of an inch. Number six, six eight, which means three quarters. So this here, half an inch. And this one here is one inch. We have a table of that, correct? Yeah, we have a table in the introduction. I can share it with you for quick. Do you remember in the same slide set? And here's a grade, just you know, for each grade, here's F sub Y, right? You see that? Yes. Okay, here's the rebar size. Number three means three eight one inch. Number four half an inch. Number eight one inch. Cross section area point uh, seven nine. Let's say for number eight. Okay. Okay. All right. Good. All right. So now the total cross-sectional area of the rebars, I have three, as I was just saying a minute ago, right? Half a minute. 0.79 for each rebar, right? I have total of 2.37 square inches. 
we are assuming usually that the steel is yielding. Why? Because we'd like to get the benefit of the yield point and the strength is going to be 6 KSI. Now, based on this equation, this equation means set tension equals compression. I have AS, I have FY, which is a tension force, 0.85. The strength is 4 KSI. And don't forget that this is going to be here in kips. So this is going to be here KSI. And everything here is going to be kips and inches. So I'm going to end up with 4.18 inches. This is going to be the A compression block depth. Now, beta 1 in this case for 4,000 KSI, or excuse me, 4,000 PSI or 4 KSI concrete, it is equal to 0.85. So now let me move to the next slide. You can see here, C, neutral axis depth, right? It's going to be equal to A divided by beta 1. It's going to be larger than 4.18. Is going to be 4.92 inches. So first I solve for A, second solve for C. Once I have the C distance, now I can do the symmetry here between these two triangles, right? I can say that 0.03 divided by 4.92 is going to be equal to the strain in the steel divided by D minus C. Where is this at? You can see it's going to be right here. D minus C, yeah. Quick question. Um, yes. What was the value of or how do we calculate beta one? Is that just a property of something? Beta one. If it is not here, it's gonna be the previous slide set. It's right here. So it is in this slide set. Beta one is gonna be based on the concrete strength. You see here, concrete strength is giving the x-axis and beta one is giving the y-axis. When the concrete strength is 4,000 or less, your beta 1 is 0.85. Once it goes to 8,000 and more, it's going to be 0.65. If it's somewhere in between, you do this interpolation based on this equation. Oh, okay, appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it's like a code concept. No problem. It's like a code concept. You said uh, if it's above, you said or in between, you said interpolate? Yeah, interpolate, yeah. Let me go back again. Let me. Uh, I have a question, Professor. Yeah. Where, where did we get the 0.79 from? 0.79, what? 0.79. Uh, was it like a cross section? AS equals something times 0.79? Yeah, good question. Give me a sec. From this table. You see this table? You see this number eight? Oh, okay. right. What is the diameter for number eight? One, one. Area. what's the cross section area for just one rebar? You see it? Where is it saying? 0.79, right? Thank you. Okay. Very good. Good question. Thank you. So, what I'm saying is if the concrete strength between 4,000 to 8,000, you do interpolation based on this equation, right? So, now I need your help if I have concrete strength of 5 KSI, what beta factor should I use? Say again. When concrete strength is 5 KSI, what is the beta value that I should use? Um, interpolate. Or... Can you use this equation? I'm not asking you to. I'm asking you to tell me what beta value. Thank you for your advice to interpolate. This is correct. But I want you now quickly to do it for me. I need your help. Because actually this is going to be in your homework. In your homework, you have 5,000 concrete. And I want to be sure that you know how to do beta 1. Armando put in the chat uh, 0.8. I agree. Very good. Excellent. Thanks, Armando. All right. Now let's move forward here to our example. So now I have beta 1 of 0.85. Now this is how I came up with the C value. Two similar triangles for the strain distribution. 0.03 is constant for concrete at the capacity point. For line 2, I'm going to divide this by this. Absolute, which is a 0.03, divide by C. 4.92. And then multiply by D minus C. 
D minus C is going to be 13 and a half minus 4.92. With that, I get the strain of 0 0.005. This is good, 0 0.0052. This means it's going to be greater than the yield point for the strain of the steel, right? You remember the yield point for the steel? 0 0.021, and in your case for the homework, for 5,000, concrete is going to be what? And the steel grade of 75 is going to be 0 0.00258. You guys remember this value? 258? Yes? Uh, person, yeah? Quick question. Can you, can you go over the correlation between the, the strain of the steel and why it's good to be better than the yield strain? Say it again. I'm sorry. Say it again. Uh, can you explain again why um, our strain is good that it's greater than your yield strain? Or because the yield strain is... How much is yield strain? You remember this equation? We have done this equation, right? Today? Correct. Okay. And this gave be only for grade 60 because it's here 60. You see this? How much is this? 0 0.002, right? Correct. Right. How much strain did I get out of this analysis? Actual strain? 0.005. Is this greater than this one? No, it's not. Sorry. Is it? 0 0.005. 0 0.005 is greater than 0 0.002? No. Yes? Anyone else? Can someone help us? Is this true that 0 0.05 is greater than 0 0.021? That's true. Yes, okay. yes. Great. So it means my assumption here is correct. This is good. Which means the steel was really at 6 KSI. This assumption here, I'm going to go back here a few slides just to show it to you again. I said here, when the strain in the steel is going to be greater than this value, the tension is going to be equal to S times Fy. Why? Because once you hit the strain at the yield point or more, your stress is going to be F sub Y. If not, it's going to be lower. So we're going to see where is this coming from. We're going to say it's going to be coming from here. Let's go back to this slide. Here is the amount of strain that you have in the steel. It's about here, right? How much is the stress in the steel? 6 KSI, right? If the strain in the steel is going to be lower than absence of Y, you're going to be here like this line, right? And in this case, the stress in the steel is going to be equal to some value, which is going to be less, right? Let me do it here in blue. You see this blue line? This is when the strain in the steel is going to be lower than the yield. And the stress in the steel is not going to be FY, it's going to be some lower value. Yes? Is it clear now or not really? I'm waiting for an answer. It's clear. Thank you. Now, I find out the strain in the steel going to go here to my chart. The chart says, you want to find out the fee factor? This is what you need to do. For the given steel information, like grade 60, how much is the yield strain in grade 60? Now, this gave it to Nathan. This question is to Nathan. How much is this value? Point what? Zero, zero, what? Point zero, zero. Two, one. Zero, zero, two, one. one. Thank you. Yeah. This gave you the yield point, right? So I'm good. Now I know this value here in my chart. How about this value here in my chart? It says absolute T equals to absolute TY, which is a 0 0.0021 plus 0 0.03. How much value are we talking about? We're going to say, let's look up. It's right here. Here's 0 0.021, which is a yield, plus 0 0.03 from this equation is going to be 0 0.05. Okay. The, the strain that we have in the steel from the previous slide, let me go back here, is going to be 0 0.005, which means it's going to be here, right? Therefore, my fee factor is going to be 0 0.5. Nathan, yeah? Sure. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now, MN, the difference between MN and FMN. Nominal capacity, tension. 
the 142.2. Where do I have it? I'm going to say just go back a few slides. You'll see it. You'll see where it's coming from. It's going to be AS times FY. Okay. Times D, the 13 and a half minus A over 2. I have this value here in KIP inch. Any moment to be reported as in KIP foot. So take this divided by 12, it's going to be 135. At this moment, this nominal moment, the concrete is just failing. So what I need to do is to use the safety and use only 90% of this. It's going to be 121. And this is the value to be used in your design and your work. So this beam or this configuration is able to resist maximum of 121.7 kilo foot. Questions before I move forward? No. All right, thank you. All right, here's another example. What I'm doing here, I changed the strength of the concrete to 5,000. This problem looks in parameters it's kind of the previous example. Look at this, 16, one and a half, right? With this B, but here the difference is 10 number eight. I have here 10 number eight rebars, lots of rebars. So what I did here, I increased the number of rebars from three, I put 10, I just threw lots of rebars. Because I'd like to study here what happens when I add lots of rebars. Is this helping? So let's say I put here three rebars, I have a moment of 121. When I have here 10 rebars, what moment do you expect to have in here? I'd like to hear from you guys. I'm almost tripling the number of steel rebars. What's your expectation for female? It's going to be tripled? Triple the moment? Do you think it's going to be tripled? Initially, I would think the more steel you put in, the more it can handle so that yeah that's my initial guess but it's gonna be tripled like what do you expect 360 maybe okay let's see just keep this value in mind so when i come to the capacity i'm gonna say how much was the capacity for three bars you're gonna say 121 or 122 roughly right let's see what happens First, the depth is going to be the same. Correct? Yeah. AS, 7.9 square inches. Y is going to be 10 rebars, right? Compression block depth. Look at this A. 11.15. Because I put here lots of rebars. So this number went up by a lot. Look what happened. This number, it jumped up. You see here, this one, 474 kips. Because I'm assuming that's going to be yielding. Look at the neutral axis depth. C is 13.94. You see this value here, C? Does this make sense that neutral axis is going to be what? At 13.94 and the depth is going to be 13 and a half. You remember the depth? 13.5 from here. You see this depth? This neutral axis. Do you think neutral axis can be here? Can this happen? Yeah? What do you guys think? Can the neutral axis be here? I'm going to ask you a hypothetical question. If I have no reinforcing and I start the neutral axis, where do you think it's going to be at? At how many inches from the top of the concrete beam? Eight. Eight. Very good answer. Amazing. This is very good. When you add more load and the bottom is going to crack. What happens? Does it go up or goes down? Goes up. Goes up. So there's no way it's going to be here, right? This is wrong. It's not going to happen. So the reason that I have this wrong answer because I'm assuming that the steel is going to be yielding, but this is not true. So this big tension force will never happen. This is wrong. It cannot happen this way, right? It means the steel is not yielding. My assumption is wrong. You see this assumption? is wrong. Does it make sense now? Yes. Okay. So in this case, I don't really have the actual stress in the steel. And the stress in the steel is going to be another variable. 
What do I mean by that? I'm talking here about this graph. I guess I'm going to be at this case, at this blue line thing, right? And epsilon s, I need to calculate that. Based on this epsilon s, multiplied by the 29,000 KSI, the slope of this line ES is giving me here the stress in the steel, meaning that this is going to be here FS. This if its value will be determined based on the amount of strain that the steel is going to be experiencing, which is this blue line. Okay. So now let me go back here to my example. You guys see the example or do you see what do you see now? Example? Yeah, number two. Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm going to see here. I have my equation. You remember this equation? This based on setting concrete compressions gave equal to the steel tension, right? In the past, I used to say AS times FY. Now, the steel stress is not going to be FY, it's going to be FS. But the point at 5, A prime C times B, this is going to be like the compression component, right? The concrete component is going to be the C component. In the past, when I assumed that the steel is yielding, I used this FS to be 60. Let me show you this again so that you know what I'm talking about. Look at this equation here. It's right here. This equation says A equals ASFY 0.85 A prime C times B, right? All of these values are known, including the F sub Y. I have only one unknown in this equation, the A, I can solve for it. Now, if FY becomes FS and I don't have it, it's going to be based on the strain in the steel. Now I'm going to have here two unknowns in this equation, right? Let me move forward here to this equation now. Let's see why do I have two unknowns. You can see here, in this case, I, my unknowns would be A and FS. Two unknowns. I understand the relationship between A and C. You see this? I know it. Yeah, C is going to be deeper. It's going to be equal to, right, A divided by beta 1. Or A, I can take it out and put C times beta 1 instead. So now I understand where is this coming from, right? Replace A with C beta 1. And then here, this FS, I'm going to replace it with ES times epsilon S. Where? From this equation. You remember the curve? I said if you have the strain multiplied by ES, give you FS. Now, where are the unknowns? Two unknowns would be epsilon S and C. Right? Epsilon S and C in this equation. I say, okay, let me substitute all the values. You can be using all the values here and get some equation between C and the strain in the steel. I'm going to say, okay, here's the equation. Some equation between C and the strain in the steam. Two unknowns in one equation. I need another equation. Where does this equation come from? I'm going to see these equations come from the compatibility. This comes from the two symmetrical triangles. Let me go back here again just to show it to you. Same equation. 0.03 divided by C like this, right? You multiply by D minus C, get you the strain in the steam. So, okay, now in our example number two, second equation, 0.03 divided by C, is giving the compressive triangle on the top, equal the strain at the bottom of the steel, divided by 13 and a half minus C. This is another equation between the strain in the steel and between the neutral axis depth. You solve them together. Here is your C value. Here is your A value, 7.41. Okay, these two equations, you solve them together, you get the value of C, value of A, value of the strain from this equation. And once you take this value here, multiply by 29,000 KSI, you get FS. So again, how would you get this value? I'm going to say, take this, I'm going to say 0 0.00137 times 29,000 KSI equals the 39.85 KSI. 
Look at this. The strain in the steel is lower than the yield point. Am I correct? You guys follow me or no? Correct. Yeah, it's lower. So the actual stress in the steel is not really 60 KSI. It's going to be 39, 85. Now I need to find out the fee factor. Here is my fee factor. How much? 0.65, right? You go straight. You hit this curve for others, not spiral. Spiral means round. My fee factor is 0.65. Yes? So here's the, the bad thing when you add lots of rebars. When you add lots of rebars, performance has been transferred from tension control to compression control. Brittle performance. What happened to the fee factor? Drop down to 0.65. And instead of losing 10% as safety, now we are losing how much? 35%. 1 minus 0.65, right? <laughs> In my equation here, I'm going to go back here to example one because I really need to relate both of them to each other. These two examples for comparison. The tension force here is equal to AS times FY. And how much FY did I use? 60 KSI. Why? Because this is based on the yield point, right? You remember I said it's going to be based on the yield point. 60 F sub Y. Now in our new example, what happened? The stress is equal to 39, about 40 KSI. So I didn't really use the steel efficiently. Number one, I lost 25% of the strength, difference between 90 to 65, right? I lost quarter of the strength. Number two, I lost one third of the steel strength. And instead of using it 60, now I'm using 40. So I'm not expecting that I'm going to be tripling the strength of the concrete by comparison. Let's see here the numbers. Here's a man, AS, 7.9, you have 10 rebars. The stress in the steel, 39. 13 and a half minus 7.41 divided by two, A divided by two, right? Look at the final strength, 167. What was the strength of the other beam was only three rebars? Can someone help with that? Yes? Was it 122? Yeah, 122. Jeff foot. You see what happened? I would think I'm going to be tripling it, like to 360. Jeff foot. It is only 167. So it is not good when you add lots of reinforcing bars. You need to be wise when you add reinforcing bars. You cannot just dump lots of rebars and think you're going to be adding lots of strength. You need to have a balanced design. This is going to be the bottom line. This is going to be the conclusion. We need to have balanced design, efficient design. You don't just add lots of reinforcing bars. It's not going to help. You don't add lots of concrete strength. In many cases, you make the concrete strength, let's say, 8,000 KSI or 8,000 PSI or 8 KSI concrete. It's not going to help. You increase the yield strength. Instead of having, let's say, three number eight, and they have six KSI, you just make them all of a sudden, let's say, nine number eight, and then you make them 100 KSI. It's not going to help. Because your problem here is going to be the fee factor is going to drop down. It's going to be one big issue. And number two, the stress in the steel is not going to be as much. It's going to drop down, if this makes sense to you guys. Professor, is there a point where adding steel would actually hurt us? Like, obviously, this it wasn't efficient, but it increased the 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 moment. Is there yeah. a point where it would just, it could actually increase? This is correct. Usually, usually, you try to keep the fee factor as 0.9. This is the conclusion. Try to keep your fee factor as 0.9. And you're not gonna be able to figure this out unless you run the analysis. You find out the strain in the steel. Try to keep the strain in the steel in this region about 0 0.0025, 0 0.05. 
Got it. Thank you. No problem. No problem. You guys see my screen or no? Disappeared, right? Yeah. Okay. Let me put it back again. Let me share it again. See now my screen? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. This is for the yield strength, right? And this is what I really want to talk about. I'd like to keep the strain and the stress and the steel to be in this box. See this box? I want it to be there as much as I can. It's okay to move it a little bit this side, you know, for the amount of strain, for the strain hardening, right? But I don't want it to be here. If the stress and the strain in the steel is giving the elastic region, it means that you may have brittle failure if you have an overloading situation. What's the overloading? Overloading means that you went beyond the capacity point and then you start to add loads to the beam. So failure as failure is not desirable. I don't want my beam to fail. But I need to be careful here. I'm going to say, Daniel, you're okay? Yeah, I just, I forgot to mute, sorry. Okay, all right. So, um, if an overlay is to happen to my beam, I don't want the failure to be brittle, meaning, you're going to be looking at the beam. The beam is flat. You start to keep um, loading it and loading it. All of a sudden, it's going to be failing. This is not good. I'd like to see lots of deflection, lots of deformation in the beam before failure is going to happen. At least, we're going to be able to get out of that place, right? So, warning is needed. I need some warning before the beam is going to be collapsing. And this would happen if I'm going to be in the yield plateau. If I have lots of strain already in the steel, means the flex of the beam is going to be happening. But if the stress and the strain in the beam is going to be here, right, in this region, the elastic, you're going to see very minor deflection and sudden failure. This is why here the code is penalizing you. They're telling you if your fee factor, if your strain in the steel is going to be in this region, right, I'm going to give you here 10% reduction in your strength. But if you're going to keep it here, I'm going to give you here 35% reduction, which is your fee factor. If this makes sense to you. Conclusion is adding lots of rebars sometimes would hurt. It's not really helping. So you got to have a balanced design, if you like. Okay. Example three. It says here concrete section shown has concrete strength 3000 psi. What beta one value would I use here? Beta one? 0.85. Yeah, 0.85, thank you. It says here, yield strength is 6 KSI, 30 inch by 16 inch, three and a half inch to the mid height of the reinforcement bars. 
the rebars is gonna be two number eight and one number nine. So in the middle here is gonna be larger power, right? And two number eight. D1 the following. Complete analysis of the section. Says muscle rupture, cracking moment, effective depth D. This is simple. I'm gonna say 30 minus three inches, right? 27 inch. Compression block dips A, neutral axis C, the strain MN, phi, and phi men. It's gonna be like complete analysis of the section. Here's FR or FCR. You guys you have seen this before, right? It's not new. This from the cracking. Cracking is stress is gonna be equal to cracking mom divided by section modulus. PT squared divided by six. Here's a cranking mom. Any questions on this? Now, let me ask you a question. Why the steel was just ignored in this analysis? I'd like to hear from you guys. Do we just care about the concrete cracking? <clears throat> yeah, at the cracking point, rebars is not triggered yet. Don't you agree? They have no effect on the performance now, right? Yeah? No? Yes. Okay, good. Next, depth. I put the three inches, so it's gonna be 27 inches. AS is gonna be two number eight plus one number nine. Number nine, it has one square inch for the cross-sectional area. Two, five, eight. You assume that the steel is yielding. Why? Because you'd like to use here F sub Y. You do this analysis, you get an A of 3.8. You guys, you told me that now beta 1 is going to be 0.85. Now my C value is going to be 4.5 inches, right? Okay, yeah, makes sense. Now the strain in the steel. Yield point, 0 0.001. I know that. Now I, I guess I can memorize this value for now, right? The strain in the steel is going to be equal to 0 0.03 divided by C. Now, this is going to be based on this symmetry, right? You have two symmetrical triangles. So, I can do this analysis, find out the strain in the steel, 0 0.015. Lots of strain. This is good. High strain in the steel is good. To a certain point that later on we'll discuss it. Here's a man. Yeah. AS times FY. I'm utilizing this very efficiently. When the strain is more than 0 0.005, you remember this value, right? 0 0.005, and yeah, this 0 0.015, three times. My fee factor is 0.9, and here's fee man. Any questions? No questions? We're all good? Nathan? No, I think I'm good. Yeah, usually Nathan, you have good questions. All right. There is this uh, minimum reinforcement that I should be adding to any steel beam. Otherwise, I cannot call it reinforced concrete. So this is going to be like different section here, different analysis, different information that you need to know about. Why is that? If you remember when we were discussing plain concrete versus reinforced concrete, we said if the reinforcing, the reinforcing is less than the minimum code values, you consider it to be plain concrete. So you need to have at least minimum of this much. This AS minimum, look at this. Here's copy and paste from the code 318. You're gonna put a box around this. AS minimum is equal to the larger of the two. Both of these two values, right? You do three, square root of f prime c, of course, it's going to be in psi, right? Divide by fy, of course, in psi, b times d. Or 200 divided by fy, b times d. You take the larger of these two and use them as minimum reinforcing bars in tension. I can do the analysis on this beam in this case. You can say, what is the minimum flexural ratio, c ratio? Because I'm concerned here when I reduce the reinforcing bars, it's not going to be considered to be reinforced concrete beam. It's going to be thin concrete. I tried this AS minimum for this given beam. 3,000, 60,000, 
to 16 by 27, I need minimum 1.18. I tried the other equation. You remember we have two equations, A and B. I need 1.44. Now, which one's the larger? We can say 1.44. This is going to be AS minimum pays on this code equation, right? How much was provided? Let me check. I provided 2.58, so I'm good. I have more enforcing that the code minimum needed. So in many cases, a designer will try to use the minimum C ratio to use the reinforcing bars efficiently, to have a very efficient design. So one of the criteria is to set the amount of reinforcing to the minimum code needed. And see if this capacity that he's going to be finding, this capacity is good enough for his design or not. If this is covering the demand, he's good. If not, he's going to start to add a little bit of reinforcing and keep an eye on the fee factor. If your fee factor is going to be dropping from 0.9, you know that your beam is not the best. You can see here efficient. It's not the, the most efficient beam, if you like. Any questions? No, not right now. All right. So with that, I'm going to be finishing it for today. Please go ahead and sign out. You can type your name in the chat room. And I'll see you next time, Tuesday, in person, in the classroom. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Go ahead and sign out, please. This also lecture, I'm going to be posting it. Record it and post it there. Have a good weekend, Professor. You too, guys. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.